Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to CypherCon. My name is Joe Cicero, and my talk's going to be Privacy in a Surveillance State Evading Detection. I have uh, a bunch of prizes also. No hard technical questions. Real easy stuff. I've got some embroidered CypherCon t-shirts, only large and extra large. I've got some uh, burner phones that are also smartphones, so uh, if you don't want to go and register them on track phone, all you got to do is register them online or, or, or use the uh, the online capability so you can win yourself a burner phone. I have four premium lockpick sets and two wallet lockpick sets. What I'm going to ask, I'm going to say, raise your hand if you know the answer to this, and I'll pick somebody. And if I pick you, you don't get to win another one if you know another answer because I want to give a lot of stuff away. All right, did everybody get the uh, the QR code there? Yes, everyone got it. No, you don't. <laughs> but good thought. All right, so there's my talk. Let's start out. I have to, I, I'm a storyteller and I want to start off with this story that will bring you, br bring you and under, have you understand how I came to be here at, at CypherCon. So does anybody, this is worth a prize. Does anybody know who this is? It's not. No. I'm looking for a specific name. All right, so years ago, this gentleman by the name of Robert Morgan contacted me in LinkedIn and said, hey, I'd like to connect with you. And on the LinkedIn message, I'm sure you've gotten this, it said, reasons why you would want to connect with Robert Morgan. And I looked at it, and I didn't know who this guy was. So I replied to the request, and I said, how is it we're linked? How do we know each other? And he replied with this. Uh, I believe I saw one of your presentations at the many events I attend. Uh, LinkedIn offered the suggestion, so I recognize your name. Now, in the original email I sent him, I said, I see that you're at the wheel of a trawler. And if anybody in here knows anybody who is into a little bit larger boats, that trawler happened to be a quarter million dollar trawler. You make a comment like that to somebody, you're eliciting a response. And this guy noticed the email, no response about me saying, it looks like you're at the wheel of a trawler. And that was my first red flag. So rather than connecting up to him, I went to the next step. And my, my students and my, uh, my, the faculty members at the, at NWTC would say, I went into Joe Cicero mode. All right. I'm going to find out everything that I can find out about this guy before I connect up to him. And what I ended up doing as a good security researcher, I ended up writing an article about it. And, and so one of the first things I did is this guy claimed to work for Microsoft. So I started by looking to see, does anybody by the name of Robert Morgan live close to where Microsoft is? And red flag number two, or no, well, there's red flag number one. No, he, he, this guy didn't live anywhere. And there was a Robert Morgan, but he was three, 350 miles away. So then I did some more research. Where'd this guy get his education? And he got his education from one of those places you send $60 in and get your degree. And so that was red flag number two. Really, this guy works for Microsoft and he bought his degree online. And I went on and on and on finding red flag after red flag after red flag. And I wrote this article basically saying, these are the reasons why you might not want to connect to somebody on LinkedIn. Well, I was sitting in this park. And I'm not a perv. My kids were playing in the park. And I see this guy, and he really looks familiar. I got a, I got a pretty good memory. And I go up to him, and I said, you look familiar to me, but I can't place you. I've worked at multiple schools, so I, a lot of faces. And, and the guy says, my name's Michael Getzman. And I said, oh, I'm Joe Cicero. We know each other from NWTC. Yeah, 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 yeah. And after some small talk, Michael says to me, do you know Robert Morgan? And, and I said, and I went off on a tirade. I said, yeah, that guy, I wrote an article about that guy. And I went through all my red flags and he was very polite. He let me go through all my red flags. And, and then he said, uh, I'm Robert Morgan. This was a fun graduate project. And so if you want to know how to manipulate the, the national media, there's your guy, okay? He manipulated 
the national media into believing the next version of Windows was going to be 128 bit. And it was published in CNET. And it was, it was just amazing. So bring it to three or four months ago when the same guy who was trying to scam me into connecting with him at Robert Morgan said, Hey, do you want to talk at my con? So I thought, sure. CypherCon con dupes presenter. I thought I would show up yesterday and there'd be nobody there. So I'm so happy that, that CypherCon is a reality and everybody's here. I, and I want to, I want to throw a shout out to Ashley. Ashley's in the, uh, in the audience here. Uh, Ashley sent me a LinkedIn request a couple of days. And when an old guy like me gets a LinkedIn request from a, an attractive young lady, my first thought is, what scam is this? But she really exists. And now maybe I'll connect with her on, uh, on LinkedIn. Okay. Some of my previous talks, hacking educational software packages or hacking ESP. That was at DEF CON. I did forensic and recovery techniques and data mining institutions for education. That one was called fart and die. Now I bring you pissed privacy in a surveillance state evading detection. If you leave this presentation with one thing, and that's that you can't trust anything, then I've done my job. You're not going to get any zero days in this. You're, I'm not going to bring any, there won't be any epiphany to you in this talk. I'm going to talk about Tor. I'm not going to teach you Tor. I'm not going to hack Tor. I'm just going to bring up all kinds of things that you should be thinking about if you want to stay private or anonymous online. Now, this talk would have been named Anonymous, anonymous, uh, anonymity in a surveillance state, evading the de de detection. But then I would have had to been called asked, and I didn't want to have a talk called asked. Okay, you help me, I'll help you. You know, you'll have to forgive me the fact that, uh, you know, you put me in jail for 18 months doesn't inspire a lot of trust. You hacked into the FBI carnivore program. You dropped in a virus. You set it back two years. We're reading every ISP subscriber's email in the U.S. It was Billy, illegal. I, I did give... federal I charge. You broke the law, okay? For a prize, does anybody know the actor that was the FBI agent? You're right here. It is. Come on up and pick something. Does anybody know his name, the, 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 his character name in the movie? Nobody knows his character name? What's the movie? Yeah, you, come on, come on up. Are they going to grab the phones? Nope, lockpick set there. Two lockpick sets gone. All right, many of you may not know it, but in 1998, the FBI's Data Intercept Technology Unit launched a project called Omnivore. Omnivore was the preceding program to Carnivore. So Carnivore in that movie was not fiction. That was a reality. In 2000, the EFF detailed the dangers of the system, and in 2005, the Associated Press reported that Carnivore had been abandoned, except it wasn't abandoned and left. It was replaced with a commercially uh, available product called Neris Insight. So since 2000, for 16 years, everyone in the room should understand that someone is trying to, to watch everything we do. That's clear. I don't normally read my slides, but I want to read this one. Your Fourth Amendment. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched, not earth and the persons or things to be seized. Now, I'm not an attorney, but it seems clear to me that that's pretty clear that they shouldn't be searching our data. And it's clear to other attorneys and lawyers, and it's even clear to some judges. So how is it possible from 2000 to now that they're able to do these type of things, the NSA, the FBI, etc.? Well, here comes the but. Since the 1960s and 70s, the Supreme Court and other courts have issued series of rulings declaring the government does not have the need to get a search warrant to obtain your personal documents 
if you've already shared them with somebody else. This is how they get away with it. Well, that's how the internet works. You have an email, you're sharing it with your ISP. You have data. How many of you ever had to sign anything when you went into the uh, clinic to get your cold taken care of, right? For, for another prize, if I use the word, the term epic, what does it mean? Uh, the, the, all right, right here in the purple shirt. Yeah, or, right, yep. And where is it? it, it it's all online, right? Come on up and pick something. So you think about that, right? Epic is now that's great if you're dying in Florida and your records are in Wisconsin. But it's a really bad thing if somebody breaks into the system. We heard yesterday about the Chinese wanting to break in all of those systems. So certainly something we want, you know, here's the reason why they feel they have the right to do that. So the next thing before I get into the depth of my presentation, am I teaching cr criminals? Well, yeah, I don't know who you are. Of course, I'm also teaching those of you that might be in law enforcement, might pick up something in this presentation and say, oh, now I realize that that's something that I need to look at. Or if you're an incident response team member, you might have some, oh, that's something that I can look at. So it's just, it's the perspective. It's a different perspective. And out on the EFF website, they, they, the, the TOR project, they say criminals can already do bad things. Since they're willing to break laws, they have lots of options available that provide better privacy than Tor. So that's how they go ahead and, and uh, uh, say that Tor is for good people also. Besides, most criminals are stupid. You remember this story? She went through the drive through called 911 because she couldn't get her McNuggets. All right, so what are reasons that you might want to keep your privacy or your security? You might say, and how many of you run into, and I'm not giving away a prize for this, put your hand in the air, if you run into somebody who says, I don't care if they're reading my email. So, yeah, the entire room, right? It happens to us all the time. I don't care. They can read my email. They can do whatever they want to do. And we run into that all the time. So here's some other reasons you might care about your anonymity or your privacy. Do, do, does anybody recall this couple a uh, year or two back that was fined $3,500 for writing a negative review? They purchased something online. It didn't go well. I think it was online, allegedly online. Didn't go well, they wrote a negative review, and all of a sudden, six months later, somebody's suing them for $3,500 because when they clip, clicked the OK button or the I agree button, they agreed that they would not write a negative review. So had they kept that anonymous, they wouldn't have had to worry about that. This is what those of you that travel, my wife wants to travel all over the place, and this is one of my concerns, right? You want to leave the country. So Australian woman arrested in the UAE over a Facebook photo. And last year, the year before, there was a gentleman, a U.S. citizen, who flew to the UAE, because that's where his company headquarters was, and was immediately arrested because of something he said about his employer on Facebook. So it's not that, all right, I don't care. If you want to travel, you might have to care. And then, of course, there's bloggers, right? Bangladesh blogger killings, police arrest three, teenage blogger killed. Uh, are, are called Lee Kuan Yu, a horrible person is arrested by Singapore police. Do you want to end up in a Singapore prison because of something you did on Facebook? So these are the reasons that you might want to stay, that you might want to keep your anonymity and keep your privacy, other than illegal things. All right, so the schedule. I want to start out today by talking about how we can look at information that's already been published or out on the web and how people have been de-anonymized. They thought they were anonymous and they weren't. Um, sometimes it's just stupidity. Other times somebody, you know, reacted to it. I want to talk about anonymizing you. So we'll get into proxy servers and Tor because every time I do one of these talks, I'll have somebody come up to me and say, yeah, but I run through. I do this and then I'll burst their bubble. And then I want to talk about attacks on, on users of Tor. So we can look at that from a, uh, from a standpoint of if you're a Tor user or some uh, uh, use some type of anonymity software. All right, de-anonymizing you. So allegedly, this guy, Scott, he hacked into the FBI's, uh, uh, what was, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the site. It's not, uh, now I can't think of the name of the site. Just had, just drew a blank. Anyway, there's this, this FBI site 
that is a, a link between the, the local business and the FBI. And it was vulnerable. And he'll say, if you read his account, he'll say, well, I hacked into it to show them, to let them know that it was, it was vulnerable. But then he tweeted it. InfraGuard, thank you. You do. Come on up. You help me out. You want to pick somebody out? <laughs> the, yeah, come on up in the black shirt. He raised his hand. Ah, InfraGuard, thank you. It was, he hacked into the InfraGuard website. And the InfraGuard website is this, this, uh, um, coalition between the FBI and the local businesses. And all of a sudden, uh, he finds a vulnerability and, and he didn't do it maliciously. If you read his account, he says, I didn't do it maliciously. And then he, he, to do a ha ha, he put it out on Twitter. And when, Nobody picked up on that. He retweeted it to the FBI. And of course, he was arrested. So telling people who you are, especially those who can do you harm, is not a good way to stay anonymous. You can't be stupid. That was stupid. Leave your ego at the door. All right. This is a British team. British team is, is sad. He can't stay on Call of Duty. He gets keeps getting killed. And he's pissed off that he keeps getting killed. So from his home, he launches a distributive denial of service attack against everybody that keeps killing him off. Of course, we're not anonymous when we're working at home. And you're going to learn very shortly, you're not necessarily anonymous when you're working from home on tour. So the police show up at his house, and mom and dad were not too pleased when they hauled him away because he was uh, 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 hacking from his house. You can't be ignorant about how the internet works. He thought he was anonymous. Many users believe that just being at their computer makes them anonymous. Nothing could be further from the truth. If you're a true IT professional, you understand all of the things that have to take place for your computer just to work. And all of those things have to be right, or all of a sudden there's something in a log file, or there's something leaked somewhere, and you have a problem. So you need to get quite an education to understand how things work before you can remain anonymous. You cannot be ignorant. All right, but sound ignorant. So the FBI and other, other law enforcement, I'm sure the NSA, other government agencies, other government agencies in other countries, have these digital detectives. And what they will do is they'll look at linguistic clues to narrow down where you are in the country or where you are in the world. So think about it. You've got all the planet, and somebody like this will come in and say, I looked at the posting, I looked at what this guy posted, and we can tell you the gender of the person, the age of the person, the linguistic background. So you have to sound different than you would normally sound. If you believe you can go out there and just post, you're wrong. Now here's something. Does anybody know the name of the program that you can download today and find out with an 80% accuracy, who posted something online, if you have a, uh, a, a, a sample of their writing. Anybody know the name of that program? All right. It's J. Stylo. And there's also Anonymouth. J. Stylo. You can go out and you can get this program. And if you have a sample of writing, I'm a network specialist instructor at a technical college, and I have a class that has lots of writing. Think about the amount of sample of writing I have on my students. So I can take samples of that writing, and if somebody wants to go out to ratemyprofessor.com, oh, I know who this is. So Anonymouth is the competing program. Anonymouth will take your writing, you feed it into Anonymouth, and it will change it so it can't be attributed back to you. If you want a great CypherCon talk for next year, think about hacking Anonymouth. I'm going to look at that and say, gee, I wonder if I can backwards this. So let's take a look at uh, what that might look at. And here's, here's the article that basically says, you have, uh, we can use this to get an 80% uh, certainty of the anonymous postings. Here's F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby, and F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby run through Anonymous. And, Anonymous. And you can see there's not a lot of big changes there. So it's still readable, it's still understandable, but it will change it so it can't be attributed back to you. 
If you want to remain anonymous online, you have to use tools like this. All right, don't forget the logs. This is another thing that people will fail to realize. So remember LulzSec, the 50 days of lulls? So we had this AT&T contractor, Lance Moore, who posted data from AT&T servers with the 50 days of lulls. When that showed up on the internet, AT&T looked at it and said, that's our data. And they, they, they recognized it and they went back to their servers and they could trace it to, I think it was three people that would have had access to that data at that time. So think about that, right? You're gonna post something and they know who's had access to it. Instantaneously, you're gonna be in trouble. So no matter what you do, or where you do it from, there are likely logs generated. Nothing should link you in these logs. Think about this. You're online, and you want to be anonymous, and you bring up Tor, or, or you bring up your computer, you run a, 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 a disk-based operating system, and you make a connection on a network that you already connected to with your computer as normal. What's the MAC address going to be? It's going to be the same. So you're trying to do anonymous stuff over here, and somewhere in the logs, you got a different IP address, but that different IP address might be related directly back to a MAC address that's related to a, to a system that connected up legitimately to your email, and now they link it back to you. Computer forensic examiners can carbon date data. So if there's data that changes slightly, they can look at that and say, if they have archival backups, they can look at it and say, I know about when this data was taken. And now they can go back to the logs and they can say, hey, it can only be this, this amount of people. That really brings it down to you being one of the people. So you cannot forget the logs. And then there's being stupid, ignorant, and the logs. And to my colleague, the Marine in the back, who did the uh, Chinese presentation yesterday, uh, some of their hackers aren't too bright. So the Chinese hackers, sponsored by the Chinese military, accessed US-based social media sites such as Facebook on the same network they were hacking the United States with. So that was stupid, and that was ignorant, and they forgot the logs. So here, you look at all kinds of problems. If you want to keep your anonymity and your privacy, you cannot make a mistake. As hackers in the room, you probably realize that in the past, people would say, all a network administrator has to do is make one mistake and I can break in their network. We agree with that? The opposite of that is now true. You make one mistake and now somebody on the opposite end of the spectrum or somebody who wants to find you can find you. So we can't forget those things. We need your son to help us make arrests before we can help him reduce his sentence. But like setting someone up? What, like setting someone up? Who can tell me the name of the actor who said what, like se setting somebody up? Nobody knows their hacker movies. All right, go ahead. Nope. No, no, no. He was the father. Nobody knows? Anybody know? The, the, did somebody over here? Okay. So that was Jason Collins. Does anybody know the name of the movie? Oh, my God. It was Snitch. Nope. You come on up and pick something out of the prize pool. Yeah, it was snitch. All right, you can't forget your friends. They're going to give you up. So here we have Masir, who maintained an active role in LulzSec. So he got busted. And they busted him, and with it, get this, within a week, he'd given up and said, I'll help you catch the other guys, and he was back online. And there was one guy who, when he came back online after a week or a month, or maybe it was a month, a month of being gone said, this doesn't feel right. That guy's still out there. Everybody else, they caught. So if you have friends that you're doing illegal things with or just want to remain anonymous with and they get caught, they're going to give you up, especially if you're in a country like China or Russia. I love this movie. Would have been a bad job to take, though. How come? Whoever took that shot's probably dead now. That's how a conspiracy works. Them boys on the grassy knoll, they were dead within three hours. 
buried in the damn desert, unmarked graves out past her lingua. And you know this for a fact? Still got the shovel. I love that. Still got the shovel. So if you want to keep a secret, you know, take a hint from the mob. Knock off everybody that knows it. What was the actor's name that was uh, doing the conversation there? Anybody know his name? Nobody knows their actors. Anybody know the name of the uh, 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 who he was playing there? That's all right. I'll get the questions you know. The name of the movie. All right, right there. Yep, you, come on up. So I love that movie. You want to keep a secret, you bury him out in the desert past Terra Lingua. Mm, no, looks like a normal web page to me, except for that little, there's that little icon at the bottom of the screen. Click on it and then press Control Shift. Oh my God. So, what do you make of all this? Simple. It's a it's a programming glitch. It's just a futz keystroke that sent you the wrong internet address. That's all. Who's that guy on the screen? Anybody know that actor? I had to pick the hard ones. How about the movie? Right here. You got the net, so you come on up and pick something. Yeah, that's the net. So, what have we learned by that? We can't trust our software. Now, this is a little old, but it doesn't matter that it's old. It's the point I'm trying to make here. So, when the FBI tried to de-anonymize people on, online, they used this program they had called CPAV to identify suspects using their location um, uh, uh, when they were using proxy servers or anonymity services like Tor. So it would inject JavaScript, and then it would report back to them, hey, this is the actual location of this person accessing this site. So you couldn't trust it. Now, maybe that vulnerability is gone, but what's the next vulnerability going to be? i got to watch my time. The next vulnerability is going to be out there. You have to understand, you can, if you want to communicate anonymously or with privacy, you have to do it understanding you can't trust the software. Who's that guy? I think this hand up over here. Yeah, that's his handle. What's his name? Samuel Clemens. Come on up. You get to pick something. I can't believe the phone's still there. All right, so... His quote was, the best predictor of future behavior, or of future behaving is past behavior. Have we had vulnerabilities in the past? Uh, uh, you think? Are we going to have vulnerabilities in the future? All right, so if you want to remain anonymous or you want your privacy online, you have to understand that. And you have to compute with the understanding that you cannot trust the software. It's happened in the past. It will very likely and almost definitely happen in the future. All right. We got to talk about Broadwell and Petraeus. So here it's all about the metadata. I want, I want you to think about this, all of you that were on the open Wi-Fi at the hotel here at, here at, uh, CypherCon and, and at your hotel. So how did Paula Broadwell and David Petraeus communicate? Well, she would only email him if she was at a hotel. She never emailed him from home. Well, how hard is it to go to all the hotels they saw access that email account and say, here's a subpoena. We want to know everybody that was here. And take those lists. I bet somebody did this in Excel in 30 seconds, right? Sort. Look, we have three Paula Broadwells. She was at every hotel. I mean, think about that. So it's all about the metadata. You can't say just because I'm going to open Wi-Fi or that I'm going to be anonymous. You have to think about anything that might be going on at that location, right? You use your credit card at a restaurant where you use open Wi-Fi to do something, you know, post anonymously or do something illegal. It's going to come back and bite you. All right, so this is really great, right? So I, I even want to read this one. Is this a trick? Petraeus and Broadwell apparently used a trick, and I love this statement, known to terrorists and teenagers alike, to conceal their email traffic, one of the law enforcement officials said. Rather than transmitting the emails to another's inbox, they composed at least some of their messages, and instead of transmitting them, left them in the draft folder. Did you hear that? They left it in the draft folder. That way it wouldn't be sent. Now, do you think that that was a trick they knew or do you think maybe Petraeus knew something like this picture that's been published out on the Internet? Did you hear about what the Google sysadmin said 
when they saw this drawing, I think this was out there on the web, oh my God. So here you have all the public internet, and you have the Google front end, and then you have the Google Cloud, and the knowledge of where SSL is no longer necessary, so they removed it. I believe now it's all there. So if it stays in its location, it never gets transmitted, it will never end up in a database. That's something that you would want to know. That's something that might allow you to keep your communications private or anonymous. Okay, coincidence? I think not. Silk Road 1's dead. We're up to Silk Road 3. Was on it last night? No, I wasn't. I just... Silk Road 3 was down, I think. I went out to see if it was out there, and it was down. So coincidence? I think not. So Ulbrich made one mistake. The creator of the Silk Road made one mistake. He used his internet email, his actual email account, to try out and find a system administrator once. And that was enough for the FBI to find out, we got to watch this guy. So then, by coincidence, a border check of a package full of fake identities was headed for San Francisco's 15th Street, apparently where he lived. Do you believe that that was a coincidence? Or do you believe that there was some communication there and we're going to watch what's going on to this address? I'll leave that up to you. That's how he was caught. There is nothing wrong with your television set. Do not attempt to adjust the picture. We are controlling transmission. I still got prizes. Anybody know what that came from? White hand in the back was first. Outer limits. Come on up. There's a t-shirt or two and left and a pick set. The outer limits. Just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they aren't after you. So understand if the, the, what I said in the first statement was, hey, if you leave here, leave this presentation with the understanding that I'm probably being monitored right now. Maybe I shouldn't do what I want to do right now. I've made my point. All right. So now we're going to go into applications that anonymize you. Um, most of you are probably aware of this. I know there are a few of you out there that aren't. Let's talk a little bit about proxy servers. Let's talk a little about Tor cl uh, Client, Tor Portable, which is currently in version 5.5.2. Let's talk about Tails, the amnesic incognito live system. That's a bootable operating disk that's supposed to keep you safe. Uh, we'll talk about the Tor Hidden Services. And then we're going to talk about the I2P project, which I learned watching a video of our uh, recorder over here. Uh, Adrian Crenshaw, which is currently in version 0 0.9.24. Now, I learned today that it's been around for 13 or 14 years, but that version number scared me. I was like, all right, I'm supposed to be remaining anonymous with this, and I'm not to a 1.0. So that was kind of concerning to me. All right, what about, what about proxy servers? Because I hear this all the time. Well, I went through hide my ass. Okay. So what about anonymity? Here's Foxy Proxy. If subpoenaed, we will disclose. So you're screwed there. Uh, here's another one. Hide my ass. We may disclose. That's kind of, all right, may. Oh, okay, we may disclose. That's like when I, when I asked over here at my hotel, hey, I got to walk over here to the Fister, and I got, I'm going to be coming back late at night. Is that safe? And the hotel guy said, well, it's relatively safe. What does that mean? Well, Anything can happen. I'm not going to tell you it's perfectly safe. And then we have, you know, Proxify. Read their fine print. This site will cooperate. Now I'm going to ask you a really important question. If it said, under no circumstances will we communicate your data to anybody, would you believe them? No. And even if they could do that, we understand that a state sponsored law enforcement agency can put a piece of equipment before or after them. I'm not familiar with that site, but I'm going to say, I, let's say it's out of the country. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about this. All right, are you familiar with, could, could that country put a piece of equipment in between that site and you, after that site? I, I, I love this. Lots of these sites are running on Amazon Web Services. I mean, come on. So, again, the last thing I want you to leave here with is, if you want anonymity and privacy, you have to go, f go forward with the understanding that it's all in the open. All right. So, 
before I get started, who here has ever run out to the torproject.org and downloaded Tor or Tales? Hand in the air. Oh, look at it. So everybody knows. All right, great. Now I want to show you something. Did you know this? NSA likely targets anybody who's Tor curious. Whether you're a regular user of web privacy tools like Tor or Tales, or you've just checked out their websites, the NSA could be tracking your online movements, a new investigation reveals. So the other day I was at a conference and I was grabbing data. I like to update my slides so you get the latest information. And I, I didn't have a computer in front of me. I said to the person next to me, hey, can I borrow your computer? And she slid it over and I went out to the Tor website <laughs> to get the version of Tor. And then I Googled this and I brought it up on the screen and I slid it back to her and I said, just so you know, you're now in the NSA database. <laughs> She's never going to give me her computer again. All right? Think about that. So you want to go use Tor now. You're already in the database. And how do you get Tor securely and privately before you go get Tor? Right? Maybe at CypherCon, they give away an optical disk with it on. Right? That would be a way to get it anonymously. All right. So Tor. Lots of hands went up when you were out there. Stands for the onion router. We know that. Tor prevents someone from watching your internet connection, from learning what site you visit. It prevents the site you visit from learning your physical location. At least that's what it's supposed to do. And it lets, uh, uh, lets you access sites which are blocked. So last week I'm at a conference and I, I need to go out to the Tor site. And I bring up, I try to go to the Tor site and it's blocked. So instead of going to the Tor site, I type pravda.ru. Does anybody know what Pravda is? Yeah, what's Pravda? Yeah, it's a propaganda newspaper. I still got a t-shirt and, uh, and a pick set. You already got one. All right, so it's a Russian propaganda website. Now, I want you to think about this. This place that was blocking me would allow me to go to a Russian propaganda website, but not to Tor. So I brought up my Tor browser and went to Tor. So they're blocking me from going to the Tor website, but they're not blocking Tor. It didn't seem right to me, but I digress. So you understand the entrance node when you go into Tor knows your IP address. They know who you are, but they can't see what your packet contents is. And the exit node, or where you leave the Tor, Tor network, doesn't know where you're coming from. They just know where you, they just know where you're going. I'm going to bounce this call through nine different relay stations throughout the world and off two satellites. It'll be the hardest trace they've ever heard. Unbelievable. Anybody know who the actress that said unbelievable is in the back? No. Ah, whoever said that is right. Did you already win something? Ah, you already won. You, you got to let somebody else win. Oh, did, yes, it's McConnell. Come on up. Yeah, it is. Mary McConnell. McDonald. No, it's McDonald. It's McDonald, not McConnell. McDonald. Did you say that? McDonald? Okay. Yeah, he did now. S smart cipher gone guy. All right, so let's take a look at Tor. This is this is actually how Tor works, all right? So you got Alice going into her entrance node, going through a relay, relay node, going through her exit node, and then going to her website address. Understand, and Tor says this right on their website, if you're not using any secure protocol to go through that, the exit node can go can know it directly who you are. And as we go forward, if you're using the same exit node to do something naughty that you're doing your email on, you're being stupid. That's wide open for them to know what's going on. All right, so this is another thing. I did to, to update my presentation for this. I brought up my tour and I said, Hey, what's, where am I going through? And the tour client, how many of you have done this? Where am I going through? And it'll tell you it's kind of cool. So my entrance node was Germany. My uh, relay node was United Kingdom. Who works with the United Kingdom? The US. And my exit node was Lithuania. Is there anybody here who knows the laws in Lithuania? Nobody raising their hand. So I don't know what the laws of Lithuania are. Do I have any expectation of privacy leaving a computer in Lithuania? So this ought to be your clue. In fact, I expect the NSA is monitoring traffic that's moving around the internet from Lithuania. I expect that. So if you're using Tor, 
with the expectation that the NSA is not watching it. Of course they're watching it. It looks like you're coming from Lithuania or whatever your exit note is. So you should understand that actually makes them want to watch you. They don't know that that's tour traffic. You're just visiting a website and the IP address is coming from Lithuania. Okay, so Tor and DNS, I get this question a lot. What DNS server am I using? Well, the DNS server you're using depends upon which DNS, which, which computer on the Tor network is going to do DNS for you. So you don't have to worry about your local DNS pulling and somebody locally knowing what website you're going to. We can install Tor. All right, so this is for if you, uh, uh, if, if you want to do anonymous web browsing, you want to use the Tor browser and not the Vidalia bundle. But if you want to do it, if you want to anonymize some other type of traffic, you're going to install it on your system. And then hopefully all your traffic is going through Vidalia. But what happens if a mistake happens? Right? What happens if one, if Adobe Acrobat Reader updates insecurely on your local connection? Do I know who you are now? So you've got to understand that. And then we have the Tor browser. This is the most popular, and it's also the, mo the highly recommended. If all you're going to be doing online, that's what you want to get. You want to go out and get the Tor browser, and it's programmed to specifically only use the Tor traffic. And when it comes up, it'll tell you your traffic is anonymized. It will also tell you if there's a, latest, a later version of uh, Tor out there for you to use. Then we, I love this. Then we have Tails the Amnesic Incognito Live System. And I wanted to ask the gentleman who did the presentation yesterday about the uh, wins and fails about uh, um, virtualizing your operating system, right? We all know what APT is, Advanced Persistent Threat. Well, if you virtualize your operating system, it's not persistent anymore. So does this help us be secure? Instead of using an operating system that might have gotten infected, now you're using a read-only disk that Certainly it could have gotten infected, but when you reboot, is it going to be infected? No, because it's read-only. So it limits a lot of previous vulnerabilities to the Tor network. Then we have Tor hidden services or dot .onion sites. This is the opposite of the client that wants to use the, the, net, the, the Tor network to surf anonymously. This is a server out on the Tor network that is anonymous. You're not supposed to know where it is. You connect up and you get it. All right, so it's considered the dark web, Silk Road's up to version 3, and it sells illegal items. All right, this is a picture of how the, uh, the Tor hidden services work. I don't want to get into any depth there. So what can we get if we run out and we start, if we bring up Tor and we go out to that dot, those dot .onion sites? Well, I want if you've done this, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but if you've bought something on Tor, I want to talk to you because I've never done it, and I want to. But I'm afraid I'm going to end up in some database somewhere. So, you know, get your UK passport. How good does that passport look? Does it look like a fourth grader printed it on their dot matrix printer? Or does it really look right? Uh, US fake IDs. I, I should be working for the US military because I bet they'd let me do this to find out how bad they are. Um, uh, become a US citizen. Real USA passport. Yay. Don't have to worry about Trump. Um, Cheap euros, so you can get counterfeit money, counterfeit U.S. dollars. Buy guns and ammunition in the U.K. Hitman Network. Don't like somebody? Knock them off. You can do it on tour. All right, so this is what, a, well, this is what an Onion site looks like. So it's got this random name. You can use other services to give your... Onion site, not so random name like Scallion. All right, so here we have different different links that might be out there that would enable you to have an Onion site that you could at least partially remember. There's also Tor to Web. So if you're Tor curious, here's a website you can go to to ac access Onion sites. Now I'm not recommending anybody go out there because your a click away from committing a felony in the United States. And who knows how many laws in other countries, right? You click on a link and it's got illegal pictures on it and all of a sudden you do them and you've broken the law. So I don't recommend if you don't know what you're doing that you're out here playing with Tor. But if you didn't want to use the Tor browser, Tor to web allows you to do that. But it doesn't make it safe. It just allows you to access Tor sites quickly and easily without using the Tor browser. So trust you say, 
Do I trust those sites? The Tor Onion sites? Oh, previous. So here, more than 400 dot onion addresses, including dozen of dark market sites, targeted as part of a global enforcement action on the Tor network. The U.S. Department of Justice took the servers over. Now they monitor who's coming in. Now you might say, yeah, but I'm coming in on Tor. But if you don't, if you make the mistake to use Tor to web, or somebody is making the Tor network you know, slow, and you decide, all right, I'm going to connect up in a different manner, now you're in trouble because it's, it's the U.S. Department of Justice or some other country monitoring who's connecting up to that site. And Tor sites, these Onion sites, aren't the most secure sites. So I went out to see what can I create on one of these sites, and I created an administrator account. I just asked for it. Gee, I wonder if administrator is open. Created an administrator. Here's one I created admin. Went out, onion site. Hey, I wonder if I can create an account on this site that's admin. That ought to tell you that these sites aren't as secure as they should be if you want to use them from an anonymous standpoint. So you can go out and you can read the Tor website for the known vulnerabilities. So we're going to talk about these in a, in a little bit. Uh, um, Correlating timings of your traffic. So this is a known vulnerability in Tor. If someone is able to get you to go through their Tor servers, they can correlate the timing from the inside to the outside. Now they know who you are and where you're going. You should understand that. They can also uh, verify a suspicion. So we're going to see an exact case where the FBI said, all right, we think this is a Tor user. Let's verify the suspicion that they're a Tor user. And then it's possible to associate non-anonymous and anonymous traffic at a given exit node. So if you're stupid and you're going to Gmail on one and hacking the FBI on the other, right? You just went out the same exit node, potentially went out the same exit node, and they can correlate that, and now you're in trouble. Okay, Tor has some recommendations. Use the Tor browser. Better than that, use Tails because it's a read-only operating system. Don't enable or install browser plugins. Use HTTPS versions of websites. Don't open documents downloaded through Tor while online. Has anybody sniffed the network traffic when they brought up a Word document lately? What does it do? Yes, it does. Amazing. Use bridges, listen to this, and or find company. That doesn't mean find a company. That means find other people that are using the same network for Tor. And we're going to look at a case like that. All right, so Tor usage examples. I love this one because I have students. I don't want to have an exam today. So I'm going to jump on the Tor network. I'm going to create an email. I'm going to make a bomb threat, and classes will be canceled, which is exactly what this guy did, right? Except the problem was that Harvard called the FBI, and the FBI called the, the email uh, provider, and the email provider said, it was Tor traffic. We can't track it for you. And so the FBI came back to Harvard and said, you have any Tor traffic on your network? And they were monitoring their network, and they said, why, yes, we do. And this is probably how it went. And only one computer was accessing Tor at the time that email was created. And they went out and knocked on this guy's door, and my guess is he folded like a cheap suit. So think about that when you're using Tor. I do. Every time I bring up Tor at the college, I'm thinking, I'm probably the only one doing this right now. So this is a great one. This is, this is phenomenal work on the FBI standpoint. I, I'd love to work for these guys, right? So they're looking at this guy, and they're, they're monitoring things he's saying. Remember I said, what was this whole talk going to be about? I still got a T-shirt. Sec? What kind of sec? All right, well, yeah. Operational security. Who said it? You don't need a shirt. Who? Uh, come on up here. It's all about OPSEC. Right? Now think about it. You make one mistake, one OPSEC issue, and you're done. So this guy went by the handle Yoho Ho. He, at one point in time, communicated to somebody that he'd been arrested at uh, the Republican National Committee, something. I don't recall what it was. 
And then later he made another, and that, and so they said, wait a minute, now we have a list of everybody that's been arrested at that. So they got a list of what, a hundred people? They go from planet Earth to a hundred people. Then he made some other issue, right? And they could go to that, one other OPSEC issue. They find that list, and what do they do like they did with Paula Broadwell? Compare the two lists, they got one guy's name. Now, they don't have enough information. So, they park, and I bet half of you have this at home, the FBI surveillance van outside their, outside his network, and they monitor his Wi-Fi traffic. At the same time, while someone is monitoring the websites that he's visiting or talking on. And so you got two guys on cell phones. This is how I envisioned it. Is he talking right now? Yep. He's on tour right now. What did he just say? He just tried to get him to run something. So they try to get him to run something, and he makes the comment, I can't get it to run. It won't play over tour. Boom. They got him. So OPSEC issues. He made two mistakes. One brought it down to 100 people. It's only a matter of time now. Another one brought it down to parking outside his house, and they got him. All right. Presumed tour attacks, so I'm coming up on time, so I'm just, I, you know, there are a lot of presumed tour attacks out there. Uh, the NSA has, in, has it installed on many, many uh, crap tons of, uh, of servers, so they're monitoring tour traffic. Uh, the chances that you'll eventually go through an NSA computer is pretty high. That's one of those uh, um, presumed attacks. The latest attack in the news is this one. Have you heard about this? Right? When I first heard that the FBI had um, had, had used researchers to de-anonymize Tor network traffic. I freaked out. I said, I can't believe that. I, I don't remember the college that did it. I can't believe that they did that. And the latest article I read said, well, they weren't working with the FBI. A researcher or these researchers compiled all this data. Somehow the FBI got, got news of it, that they had done it, and then came in and subpoenaed the data. So the researchers had to give it up. So that's scary from a researcher's standpoint. And down here it says, when you do experiments on a live network and keep the data, that data is a record that can be subpoenaed, says Matt Blaze, a computer science scientist at the University of Pennsylvania. As academics, we're not, we're not used to thinking about that, but it can happen, and it did happen. He's called from six different payphones from two different cities, never using the same phone twice. What's her name? Uh, the, the gentleman in the back. Yeah, come on up. I think I got one shirt left. Okay, she can grab it. Yeah, additional recommendations, right? Use true trade craft. Open Wi-Fi networks. Now, what have you learned today about using the open Wi-Fi network that you want to stay anonymous or keep your privacy and using the same network at any point in time with your real system? You can't make that mistake. Use a high gain, high gain Wi-Fi adapter. How many of you have walked around and saw cameras up? I've got four cameras on my house. The other day, I'm in class. My phone vibrates. I pull it up, and I'm watching video in my house of my kids closing the garage door and running underneath it to watch it go up. They're going to learn. They're under scrutiny all the time. So you can't just use a Wi-Fi network because you're sitting there because there might be access, there might be video. So you might want to think about using a high-gain Wi-Fi adapter, one of these two-watt alpha adapters. Use a Tails-only system so that you don't end up with something that's going to stay a persistent threat on your system. Don't reuse previous locations like the movie shows us. Randomly choose your location so it's not like, well, we see that he's going through all the Wi-Fi around this line or she, this would be the next one. Let's start watching that. Do you think using Wi-Fi and using Tor uh, might be dangerous? Well, France is looking at blocking, is banning Tor and blocking Wi-Fi. So if we believe this article, if this is a Michael Getzman writing this article, trying to get us to not use Tor and open Wi-Fi, certainly these are tactics that we might want to want to look at. Additional considerations. Here's an article about the NSA's massive database struggling under the weight of spam. Well, maybe 
We want to communicate through spam. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. You're not sending out one spam message from you to one other person because they would know you're communicating. You would send it out from the spam relay to 10,000 people, and only the one that you want to communicate is going to take that message and know what to do with it. How many of you have seen this website, Spam Mimic? Anybody? Great, great website. So you go out to this website and you type your message in here. And I put more than this is a secret message. I had a, I had a great big long statement there. You put it in and you click in code and it creates a spam message for you. You take that spam message, you send it to whoever you want. They know they have to go decode it from Spam Mimic and it's done. Now, what's going to happen when you connect up the Spam Mimic from home? Have we learned a little bit? All right, so I might not even say use Spam Mimic, but the idea is kind of cool. You might want to communicate through spam messages if you don't want state-sponsored people monitoring it. What you should learn from this exercise, and learn it well, Rule number one, do not get caught. I'm Joe Cicero. Thank you, CypherCon. Have a great con.